One third of all adults suffer symptoms of insomnia and around 20% have a sleeping disorder. And then there are the rest of us who struggle with sleep but never really get any professional help for it. And sure, many well-meaning people might stress to us the importance of getting enough rest at various stages of our lives, but very few of them are truly able to tell us why sleep is so important and how we can get better at it. We're also rarely, if ever, told about the very dangerous long-term implications of poor sleep. So in this video, I've decided to help do something about all of that. By the end of our time together, you'll have not only learned a ton of things that you didn't know before about sleep, but you'll have also learned eight unique and simple strategies that you can start using right away to get better sleep. To start things off though, let's look at why sleep is more important than you think, as well as the major factors that determine whether you'll actually feel rested when you get out of bed. As you're likely already aware, good sleep yields both immediate cognitive benefits and physical benefits. But what you're probably not aware of is that your sleep, or lack thereof, also has longer term implications for your health and your lifespan. If you get proper sleep, you'll not only be mentally sharper over time, you'll also be physically leaner too. On the flip side, if you neglect proper sleep, you'll escalate cognitive decline and accelerate disease. When it comes to your brain, sleep not only enriches a lot of logical functions such as learning and memory consolidation, it also recalibrates your emotional brain and helps you to navigate any social and psychological challenges too. When it comes to your body, you're likely aware that sleep replenishes your immune system and helps with fighting sickness, but this is not all that sleep does. It also finely tunes your metabolism, regulates your appetite, and supports your gut microbiome. In fact, sleep, or lack thereof, affects every major tissue, system, and organ in your body, right down to the cellular level and your DNA. But before you can start improving your sleep, you first need to know what governs your sleep. You see, there is a part of your brain called the hypothalamus, and within the hypothalamus is something called your suprachiasmatic nucleus. I know it's a mouthful, but this is your body clock, and it governs your sleep by coordinating your circadian rhythms. And as you'll soon learn, your circadian rhythms govern many bodily functions beyond just your sleep. On average, the duration of an adult circadian rhythm cycle is 24 hours and 15 minutes, and that's not too far off the 24 hour rotation of the Earth. Although your circadian rhythm is obviously not exactly 24 hours, you can routinely experience light from the sun to reset your inaccurate body clock each day. Light is the most powerful and reliable signal that influences your sleep-wake cycle, and it tells your brain to stop secreting the sleep hormone melatonin and to start secreting other hormones that promote wakefulness, such as adrenaline and cortisol. But it's not only light that our brain uses for this body clock resetting purpose. Light is just one zeitgeber of our circadian rhythm. And what's a zeitgeber? Zeitgeber is a German word meaning time giver, and it refers to environmental variables that can act as a circadian time cue. Although not as strong as light, Zeitgebers other than light are still very powerful. In fact, they explain why blind people have a circadian rhythm. Strong Zeitgebers, apart from light, include food, temperature, exercise, and social cues. When it comes to food, few people are aware that eating your meals at the same time each day helps calibrate your circadian rhythm. Eating raises your metabolic rate, it diverts blood flow to your digestive system, and it increases your body temperature. This means that when your body is digesting a meal, it's harder for it to relax and go to sleep. That means that eating lots of food around bedtime is a bad idea, but also eating spicy foods and larger portions of protein before bed is also a bad idea. These types of foods have a higher thermic effect, meaning that they'll raise your core temperature and will likely keep you awake at night. And speaking of temperature, your body temperature follows a pattern coinciding with the release of your melatonin. Your body temperature is usually lowest in the early morning around 4.30 a.m. and peaks early in the evening around 6 p.m. Sleep typically occurs when your core temperature starts to drop from its peak and waking up typically occurs when your body temperature begins to rise from its bottom. Interestingly, if you were kept awake all day and night without any external interference to your body temperature, your body temperature would maintain the same pattern. This is also another reason why you shouldn't put yourself in temperature controlled rooms all day, as this can negatively impact your circadian rhythm and your sleep. And I'm sure that you're also aware too that when your body's in a cooler environment, it can transition into a deep sleep better and maintain it for longer. This is because cooler temperatures trigger your body to produce more melatonin and melatonin helps you lower your body temperature. Exercise can act as a zeitgeber because it helps reduce stress. Reducing stress enhances your body's ability to produce melatonin, which in turn leads to improved sleep. On the other hand, when your stress levels increase, this lowers your melatonin secretion and thus lowers your ability to fall asleep. Although the mechanism is not fully understood, it appears that exercise can also enhance your slow wave sleep too. Slow wave sleep is the deepest stage of your sleep where your brain and your body undergo essential restorative processes. And if you train regularly, I'm sure you can attest to your workouts being harder and exercise intensity diminishing when you're sleep deprived. The timing of your exercise matters as well, with many people finding that exercise too close to bedtime can keep them awake. This is of course due to the rise in body temperature, but also the endorphin release associated with exercise. 
So if you're going to exercise, especially with intensity, be mindful how close you do it to your bedtime. And it's not only activities like exercise that can act as a zeitgeber and affect your circadian rhythm and your sleep. Socializing can have a big impact as well. Your daily routines around things like work, school, and regular social interactions can cue your body clock about when to wake up, but also about when to go to bed. This is why distressing life events such as divorce and job loss can be much more than just emotionally challenging. They can also disrupt a person's body clock by causing changes to their daily routines. These situations can create a vicious cycle of sleep deprivation where the loss of a daily routine impacts routine bedtime, which then alters routine wake up time, which then further alters other daily routines, and the cycle repeats in a downward spiral. This is why recreating stable routines is one of the hardest things you can do, but also why it can do wonders for your sleep. It's important to understand too that zeitgebers are also interrelated. For instance, exposing yourself to light at nighttime is going to impact the way you fall asleep and your quality of sleep, which in turn can impact your capacity to exercise the next day. Eating a large meal before bedtime will not only impact your ability to fall asleep, it will also likely impact your morning feeding time and subsequently your other regular feeding times the next day. But before you go thinking that everyone should universally follow the same daily routines, think again. Not everyone's circadian rhythm is the same. Your sleep chronotype and circadian rhythm is hardwired into your DNA and it can vary greatly from person to person. For instance, the circadian rhythm of an early bird chronotype peaks early in the morning and troughs early in the evening. Night owls, on the other hand, naturally prefer to go to bed late at night and wake up later in the morning. The remaining chronotypes often lie anywhere in between and if you don't know your sleep chronotype, you should seek to find out sooner rather than later. It has an immense bearing on your energy levels, your mood, and your longer term health. For instance, night owls are often chastised for being lazy people who sleep in, when these people are naturally more awake and productive later in the day, when early birds usually are not. And workplace hours and performance for the longest time have been wrongly in favour of early birds. This persistent bias doesn't go without consequences either. It manifests into increased chance of health problems in night owls. And this is something to be aware of whether you're an early bird, a night owl, or any chronotype in between because it has wide-ranging implications for the whole of society. And maybe you think I'm overinflating this. Well, let's consider that globally, sleep deprivation amounts to around $680 billion annually in economic losses. And these costs not only include lost productivity and absenteeism, they also include healthcare costs relating to sleep disorders, as well as workplace, motor vehicle, and other accidents relating to sleep deprivation. So yeah, sleep should be taken more seriously, both on a societal and a personal level. And if you're wondering why it's important to personally establish a good circadian rhythm and get enough sleep, then consider the following biological processes that your body clock orchestrates beyond just sleep. As you can see, neglecting your sleep can severely compromise your vital functions and amplify many problems for you, whether it's accelerated cognitive decline, DNA damage, or compromised immunity. The consequences of poor sleep are not only bad in the short term, but they're also disastrous longer term as well. Oh, and if you're sleep deprived, you're also more likely to be overweight. Great bonus, right? Now that you know the true importance and impact of sleep, the question is, what can you do about it if it's not optimal? Well, here is a part where I share my own pre-bedtime routine and some strategies that I've personally found helpful when it comes to getting better sleep. Later on, I'll also cover some more universal strategies for improving your sleep as well. The first way I seek to improve my sleep is by establishing a routine, but not so much around a wake-up alarm. Now, I mean setting a going to bed alarm on my phone 90 minutes before sleeping. The reason I set a going to bed alarm on my phone is because it's not just a cue to start winding down and getting ready for bed, it's also a signal to start turning down lights, putting away my phone, and turning off other devices like the computer and the TV. These devices emit blue light, which interferes with your melatonin production. Hence, it's a good idea to minimize blue light emission as much as possible in the evening time. This is also the reason why I've invested in good blue light blocking glasses. These can help reduce my exposure to blue light and ensure I have better quality sleep. I've experimented with many of these types of glasses, and if you're curious to know which blue light blocking glasses I've found to be best, see the description of this video. It's important to know too, that many blue light blocking glasses on the market don't actually block much blue light. A simple way to test this is to notice if you can see the color blue whilst wearing them. If you can, the glasses are not blocking blue light. See my other video on this topic if you're curious to know why this is so. Blue light exposure is also one of the main reasons why I stopped using my phone as a wake up alarm and started using an alarm clock instead. I either put my phone in a separate room or walking distance from my bed so I won't be tempted to look at it before dropping off to sleep. Phones not only interfere with going to bed and getting to sleep, but they also interfere with getting out of bed and waking up properly too. If you kept a tally, you'd be mortified by how much time you can waste on your phone in both the evening and morning time around bedtime. And it's not just what you look at that can wreak havoc on your sleep. The same is true for what you hear as well. 
be sure to minimize noise around sleeping hours, and earplugs are an option if you can't remove external noise. Personally though, I prefer to sleep with some consistent white noise instead, and this tends to drown out any external sounds that I might otherwise hear. A fan is perfect for drowning out noise and also keeps you cool, so give it a try. And this leads into the next thing I do before bed, and that is to cool down my body in my room, and I don't mean turning on the fan or the aircon as soon as I'm about to drop off to sleep. No, if it's not winter time, I run the aircon or the fan for 20 minutes before I hop into bed. This way the room can be at a set temperature before going to sleep and it can drop off to sleep quicker because it will take less time for my body to adjust to the temperature changing. Remember too, that you always sleep better slightly cooler than hotter. So if you're feeling a bit warm, it's better to err on the cooler side. If you're wondering how cool, a sleeping temperature between 65 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit or 18 to 20 degrees Celsius works best for most people. Apart from ensuring that my sleep environment is cool and free from noise, I also want to ensure that my room is dark enough as well. This is achieved with blinds down and thick curtains across windows. If you don't have thick curtains and you have light creeping in, blackout curtains are a great investment. An eye mask is also a good cheap investment too, and this is essential for me if I'm traveling or staying away from home. And finally, right before hopping into bed, I empty my bladder, even if I don't need to go to the toilet. There's always something in there, and it's always better to not wake up to pee during the night if it can be avoided. A sensor toilet light is also very handy too. This way, if you do need to wake up and twinkle, you can do so without flicking on the lights that will wake you up even more. When it comes to the 90 minute window of winding down before bed, this tends to be very individualized. For some people, they tend to relax best with things like stretching, deep breathing, and other relaxation rituals, whereas I personally like to read a paperback book under an ambient light. Also, if I'm worried about something before bed, I like to diarize it with pen and paper and also think of three positive things about my life that day, which I'm grateful for. Affirmations also work really well for me too, and remember that the first thing that you think of when waking up is often the last thing that you thought of before going to bed. Hence, to lessen anxiety, not only around sleep, but also waking up, it's best to have a positive frame of mind. If you're restless in bed too, it's often best to get out of bed and do something to relax and then hop back into bed when your mind's more at ease. Although subjective measures of sleep are important, I don't solely measure my sleep by how I feel. I also like to track my sleep objectively too and aim for 35 90 minute cycles per week, which comes out to be about 7.5 hours per night. This is a sweet spot for me and yours might be slightly less or more depending on your own individual needs. But you won't know your sweet spot with sleep unless you measure it. And you don't need to invest in fancy sleep gadgets either to see improvements with your sleep time. A simple diary or sleep tracking sheet like this works well too. I'll explain why I measure my sleep in 90 minute cycles a little bit later on in this video, but for now, my advice is to find some way of recording your sleep time. Apart from these tips you may have taken away from my own sleep routine, there are some other handy principles that are more universal when it comes to getting better sleep. The first and most important principle is establishing a routine. This means that you need to go to bed and wake up at the same time each day if you can. Your body needs a consistent circadian rhythm for consistently good sleep. Depriving your body on some days and trying to catch up on others doesn't help establish your pattern and your body doesn't function optimally this way. And I realize this isn't the best news if you're a shift worker or a parent of a young child, but unfortunately, I don't make the rules and you just need to do the best you can in these situations. It's also important when establishing new bedtimes and waking up times to do so gradually. Adjust your bedtime and your wake up time by 30 minutes each day until you get to your optimal sleep wake time routine. Not only will your body adjust better this way, but it's also an easy adjustment for other Zyte keepers like your eating and exercise times. In the same respect too, if you adjust other routines like eating and exercise, try to do so in small amounts so that your sleeping routine doesn't get interfered with. And speaking of routines, it's not just the hours that you sleep that you need to consider. You also need to consider the timing and length of any daytime naps that you might take. As a general rule, it's wise not to go over 30 minutes with your naps because this will make you fall into REM sleep. When you arise from this state, it can make you groggy, but it can also mess up your body's calibration for your nighttime sleep as well. For similar reasons, you should avoid naps later in the day towards bedtime because these can affect your ability to fall asleep at night. And when it comes to falling asleep at night, a word must be said about caffeine. Avoiding caffeine well before bedtime is important for ensuring that you not only get to sleep, but that you also have good quality sleep as well. Caffeine delays melatonin release and affects your circadian rhythm in several ways. Along with interfering with your adenosine receptors, caffeine reduces both your deep sleep and your REM sleep. And few people realize that caffeine is a powerful drug and can affect your sleep long after you've consumed it. It has a half-life of six hours, but an even longer quarter-life of 12 hours, meaning that a coffee at lunchtime can still be in your system at midnight and affect your sleep. And you may argue that you can fall asleep with caffeine in your system, but I can assure you that you won't get as deep a sleep with it there in your system. 
See my other video on caffeine for everything you need to know about this substance from both a health and a performance standpoint. And if we're talking about caffeine, we also need to talk about the second most widely available psychedelic drug in the world, alcohol. Alcohol is not only a diuretic that can make you get up and go to the bathroom frequently during the night, it also suppresses your melatonin production and interferes with your circadian rhythm. And if you're using alcohol to relax and wind down before bed, realize that as alcohol starts to metabolize more, its sedative effect starts to wear off. This causes a rebound and waking up effect that prevents you from getting into the deep sleep and REM sleep stages that you need. Alcohol in your system keeps you in the lighter stages of sleep, and those who drink more alcohol get less sleep over their lifespan. It's interesting too, that if you consume alcohol, you're statistically more likely to consume caffeine as well. Like caffeine, there are also no health benefits to be gained by consuming alcohol, especially around bedtime. See my other video on alcohol to understand how it works and how you can mitigate its effects. Caffeine and alcohol are not the only common drugs you need to worry about when it comes to sleep. Prescription and over-the-counter sleeping drugs can also negatively impact your sleep as well. It might seem counterintuitive, but don't embrace sleeping pills. Popular sleeping pills like benzos and various C-drugs can help you fall asleep or stay asleep, but they don't necessarily provide you with the same quality of restorative sleep that natural sleep does. Natural sleep consists of different stages, such as REM sleep and slow wave sleep, and these stages of sleep play essential roles in things like your memory consolidation, your immune function, and various other mechanisms in your body. Sleep medications often focus on inducing drowsiness and sedating you without fully replicating your natural sleep stages. Sleep medications can be helpful in specific situations such as short-term insomnia or jet lag, but longer-term use can lead to problems, especially around tolerance, dependence, and rebound insomnia. And at this stage, you're probably wondering about more naturally occurring sleep supplements and whether any of these can help you with your sleep. Well, one of the most popular sleeping supplements surprisingly has not been proven to help you sleep. Yep, I'm talking about supplemental melatonin. Unfortunately, it's often not what it's claimed to be. Over-the-counter melatonin is not commonly regulated by governing bodies, and melatonin concentrations can range anywhere from 80% less to 480% more than what's claimed on the label. Regardless of the concentration though, melatonin supplements have only been shown to improve sleep in some cases, and the evidence for its purported benefits regarding sleep isn't entirely conclusive. It appears that melatonin may help a person fall asleep, but it doesn't necessarily help a person stay asleep. One supplement that does show a bit more promise though is magnesium. Magnesium can influence the production of your melatonin while also helping you to relax. It achieves the latter by regulating the neurotransmitters that calm your nervous system. If you're curious to see which magnesium I personally use, see the description below, but just be sure to consult with your doctor first if you plan on taking a magnesium supplement. The reason being is that there are a few health conditions that magnesium supplements may impact upon. Another tip for better sleep is to invest in your mattress and pillows more so than your bed frame. Finding a mattress that has the right firmness as well as a pillow that is best for your sleeping position is worth your time and money. After all, you spend a third of your life in bed, so the importance of proper sleep shouldn't be skimped upon. It might take a bit of troubleshooting, but quality sleep is essential and it's best to get these things right. And getting back to what I touched on earlier about 90 minute sleep cycles, the reason I track my sleep in these intervals is because humans sleep in cycles of this duration. These 90 minute cycles consist of light sleep, deep sleep, and REM sleep stages. Thus, if you wanna wake up feeling more refreshed, it's best to do so at the end of a 90 minute cycle. And when it comes to your sleep-wake cycle, it's not only important to ensure that your environment is dark while you're asleep, but also that you have some bright light exposure to the sun while you're awake during the day. This is because sunlight helps regulate your sleep-wake cycle, and it's important to be fully awake as much as it is to be fully asleep. Always remember too, that wakefulness and sleep are under the control of your circadian rhythm, not the other way around. Now I realize that you might feel overwhelmed with all these tips and bits of advice around sleep. If that's the case, my advice to you is to implement only a few of these changes at a time so that these become ingrained and habitual. When a few of these habits do become ingrained, you can then keep adding a few more at a time into your lifestyle. Many of these habits will likely take a decent amount of time and effort, and getting enough sleep is often not an easy thing for most people. In fact, sleep is one of the hardest things to get right, but also one of the easiest things to mess up. However, if you work hard on your sleep, it will pay off immensely for you and everything else in your life will usually get a whole lot easier. Do let me know in the comments section below about any struggles you've had with your sleep or even sleep tips that you've found to be helpful. While you're at it too, remember to check out the other resources that I've linked below as well. That's all from me now on sleep. Thank you for watching and I look forward to seeing you next time.